K&A Custom Crafts on Facebook. Hello and welcome to a Tuesday edition of On Deck. I am Big B, the starting pitcher for this crew. Next to me is my catcher, uh, Chris P. Bacon. How you doing, bud? Not too bad. All right. And then we got a call to the bullpen today. Former MLB pitcher, Josh I'm going to let you pronounce your last name because I know I'm going to butcher it. So welcome, Josh. How are you doing? Good. My last name is Renicky. The O is Renneke. silent, but it gets okay. everybody. All right. So, Josh, you played for a few different teams, the Reds, the Blue Jays, the Rockies, Twins, and then it looks like a little minor league team there. So yeah. Um, just tell us about um, your career and, I guess, uh, what you've been up to these days. <laughs> yeah, so I played – I went to UCLA, played there for four years. I got drafted by Cincinnati in 06. And I was just telling Chris that I was a, we had a great group coming up through the ranks. I, I started at the very bottom because I didn't pitch much at UCLA. I was a center fielder. So I was brand new to pitching kind of. They started me in the GCL. I was 23, almost 24. And that's just, you know, full of 16, 17-year-olds. So it's it it kind of crazy. But I did well there. went to rookie ball with them and just kind of – I did – my arm was getting better. I was throwing harder, and so they had me skip the next level. And then I went to high A the next year, and then double A, and then triple A in the big leagues the next year. So I, I kind of flew through the system, being a little older and throwing hard. Um, made my debut in 08, September in Arizona. And then 09, I didn't break with the team. I was started in triple A and then got back to the big leagues and got traded to Toronto at the deadline. So I was just telling him too, that was kind of bittersweet because we just got done playing the Blue Jays and I had a good buddy on that team and the city was awesome. I'd never been to that city before. So I was excited in that sense, but also a little down just because I knew, I knew that the Reds were going to be good because we had all of our talent from the minor leagues coming up through the system. And uh, sure enough, they won the division two in the next three years while I was in Toronto on a, with a big time losing record and then kind of up and down the minor leagues in, um, uh, in 10 and then got claimed by the Rockies in 11, got called up that year. And then in 12, I broke with the team for the first time. I was up all season with them. I pitched really well, actually. Um, I think it's when analytics kind of started because I like a 3.2 ERA on the year and I led all of baseball and innings out of the bullpen in Coors field and, I guess it wasn't good enough, and they let me go. Or put me on put me on waivers, and uh, Minnesota picked me up. In thirteen, broke with them. Was up there all year with them. Had another collapse in September, which was frustrating because that's my arbitration year, and oh. never got back. So that after that, I went to the minor leagues the next two or three years, and then um, international for the four years after that, all the way up to two thousand twenty in September when I. My, my last year playing. Okay. So, um, your dad played ball for Baltimore, I believe it was. So, how was yep. it growing up uh, with your dad being in the majors already and in, in the clubhouse and stuff? Oh, it was, I mean, it was awesome. So, I was born in Baltimore in 83. He was with those teams in the early 80s. They were, you know, really good. But we moved to Northern California when I was about three years old. But, um, so I don't remember too much of the Orioles days, but then he was with the Braves in '87, '88. So I was five or six then. I remember, I remember those days and being able to go on the field and clubhouse and hang out, which was awesome. And I think he retired at 33, so he was young. And I think it's one of those things. We were on the West Coast; he was in the East Coast. He wasn't playing as much, and just you know, back then there's no FaceTime, there's no cell phones. It's just I think having three boys back home, and you know, our mom watching us and kind of raising us in that sense he kind of missed it and you know, want to get back to us so it's crazy to think that he was only 33 but I, I think he wanted to get back into it a little a few years down the road and I think at that time he was too old but it was great he got he came home and coached all our teams every sport so he he jumped in the fire and, and kind of took over and then it what was cool too is when he was cool. done playing 
he started scouting too, which is cool. And so we'd go on scouting trips all the time with him across the country in the summer, or we'd go to like the Stockton was kind of nearby. And so we'd go to the Stockton games. We'd, we'd go in the stadium and he'd write the lineup out for us. And he'd just put right hand or left hand hitters. So we'd leave the stadium <laughs> and we'd go to each parking lot whenever right or left was up and just get all the foul balls for, for batting practice. So <laughs> we always enjoyed doing that. Nice. We need this baseball. <laughs> right. And it, it worked out for him because he can focus on the game after he scout while we're just, you know, chasing foul balls instead of bickering and, and messing around in the in the stands. Okay. So, Chris, you got a question for Josh? Yeah, I'm going to kind of go off of what, what Tim Fielder said. He says, uh, where was uh, Rookie Ball? Rookie Ball was in Billings, Montana. Okay. So, I think, and, and I think we had – I think we had seven guys on that team make it to the big leagues, which is a lot for a low level like that. So okay. that's when we kind of started seeing the, the talent that we were coming up with. So outside of your dad, I'm guessing, uh, who did you like watching play growing up? Um, but I got older. I really – Barry Bonds was my favorite. He was a giant at the time. I'm from Northern California, so it's kind of our hometown team. Um, and then I love Andrew Jones. Oh, yeah. He, he was with the Braves and one of my dad's old teams, and I mm-hmm. love playing outfield. So I remember one of the scouting trips is what kind of why I liked him a lot is we got to see him in double A in like Greenville, South Carolina, I think, when he was 16 in double A. And I went oh, down nice. to the clubhouse. My, my dad would take me down there, and I got his autograph like five days in a row in the clubhouse. I think he was starting <laughs> to get annoyed. But um, <laughs> he just flew through the system from there, got to the World Series at 18. I remember that. Yep. And then uh, I got to face him actually in when I was with Toronto. And he hit a triple off me dead center. So, what what was that like facing a guy that you idolized? It was cool. He was he was kind of on the back, not, definitely in the back nine back then. But um, I remember I had a three two count. I tried to throw a fastball by him, and I left it middle middle at the knees, and he's he kind of pimped it too, and it went off the wall. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, Chris, you got anything else for him? Uh, what what was your favorite stadium to play at? I actually, so in 13, I actually got my two that I needed to complete all 30. So I pitched in all 30 stadiums, which was awesome to get in my last year in the big leagues. But um, I'd say St. Louis is probably my favorite. I don't know. It was just the atmosphere. It's a sellout every game. It's a good place to pitch. It was a cool city, but that was always, I always enjoyed pitching there. Okay. So in your travels through the big leagues, um, what was like – some differences in the clubhouses, you know, going from team to team. What was that like? Um, I think as you kind of get more established, it, it kind of loosens up a little bit just because, you know, being young with uh, the Reds, you know, the call up of being a rookie and I'll still considered a rookie in 09, I think you just kind of mind your own business and kind of stay back and just, go about your business in the field but um and then i go to toronto so now i'm kind of out of place there and they're all older bullpen and i'm still you know in my 20s and so that was kind of similar just kind of a we had roy hallidays in that team you had a, a lot of savvy vets and you know possible hall of famers so people are a little more it wasn't as loose walking on eggshells a little bit and me being new and not knowing guys that great it was it wasn't enjoyable as um as some of the other ones that i was a part of with Colorado. We had a good group there and, and just loose and good camaraderie, you know, pitchers and position players kind of blending together. And uh, that was probably my favorite, I think, in that, that clubhouse with the Rockies. And then Minnesota was, it was cool too, but it's just all those scenes. We, we lost so many games. It's just hard to <laughs> enjoy it as much as you can. If, if, you know, if you're one of those teams that's playing in September. Okay. So being a, I mean, we know starter pitchers, you know, they know they're going to pitch every five days. So how do you keep yourself ready and willing to pitch as a reliever? Yeah. I mean, it can be, it can be tough. I mean, you go from, especially if it's cold out, I mean, you go from sitting for, you know, two or three hours straight and then a phone rings and get going quick. So we just try to fifth round, fifth inning comes around and you you start moving around and just kind of getting the muscles going and just start, standing and walking around and pay attention to the game and, and kind of get your mind ready as well. But it's definitely different because I'd never started until 15, I think in uh with Milwaukee and AAA, I started and then 
um, 17, 18, 19, 20 international ball. I was a starting pitcher and I, I liked it. You know, it was crazy because coming up as a reliever, I was a closer throwing one inning and I couldn't understand how these guys were throwing 100, 120 pitches. And like, I can never do that. Like that's, and just your body just kind of starts evolving into it as you, you know, take it and go with it in spring training and kind of build up to those. But um, I, I enjoy the routine for sure. Okay. Um, Chris, you got anything? Yeah, and we talked about it earlier, but what's the differences between international, you know, baseball and what we have here? Yeah, it's – here it's – definitely the big leagues, it's very professional, I feel like. And out there, it's – not just out there. I mean, you got Mexico, Dominican, Venezuela, and winter ball. It's just – they kind of incorporate the fans. So, there's you know, there's cheerleaders and – Music, music going the whole time like those stadiums can get loud or they're shaking almost and you're pitching so it was that's definitely a a change and like we, we were talking about the pandemic before chris and uh, mm-hmm. at one point they hadn't we had no fans in taiwan so you're pitching in silence so that was oh that would be hard it was weird but you could also like focus a little more i feel like and just kind of hear the sound of the bat and things that you don't only like get to hear usually but Besides that, it's obnoxious for nine innings straight, and it's impressive because <laughs> this, those fans will memorize the dances and they won't stop. Okay. Um. So you got to, you know, play in both leagues. Uh, of course, now you know with the National League going to the DH rule. Um, did you enjoy getting that chance to get at bats, or how was it for you? Yeah, I hadn't done it in a long time, so that was. 2012 when I was we were kind of doing a piggyback system so I was mm-hmm. coming in after our pitchers would go 75 pitches and so I was you know I'll go in the fourth fifth and sixth inning sometimes and that was the first time I hit since probably 06 in college so it was, it was definitely rusty but um I enjoyed it you know I always didn't do very well but, but I I enjoy the, the the challenge of it and unfortunately our our rule there with from our manager, Jim Tracy, was you had to take a strike. So uh, that always got to me because a, a pitch is fine because you go 1-0, that's fine. Yeah. Now you know it's coming. But no, if, if you go 1-0, you got to take the no strike. And then you go 2-0, now you definitely know it's coming. You still got to take a strike. So it was just weird to kind of give the advantage of the pitcher in that sense because if I'm facing a pitcher, I'd love to go 1-0 or 2-0 and you're still taking a fastball down the middle. Yeah. Okay, so let's turn back the clock a little bit. July 24, 2012. Remember that date? Would that... That would be in Arizona. Yeah, first hit off Joe Saunders. Yep, I was going to ask if you do that. There yep, you go. Got the ball. Uh, what was that like? Um, I mean, it was cool to get it out of the way. It was my typical shoot the, shoot the four hole, hard ground ball to the four hole, so... That was usually my bread and butter, even in college, just kind of staying to the right side. But yeah, it was definitely cool to get that get that one out of the way because I think well, I one for twelve that year, so I'm glad I got one. Yeah. So you brought up analytics. Uh, what do you What do you think growing into the game? Uh, do you think the analytics is helping, hurting? You know, I think I think the way they want to use it is hurting just the game in general, I think there's a happy medium with both. I think you need, I just think about, you know, my dad has not been able to get a job in baseball in 10, 15 years now, because they don't want guys like him anymore. They don't want guys that have all the experience and played. <laughs> they want, they want young yes men that can do analytics, but you need someone to actually evaluate and see what someone can do and things that a piece of paper can't tell you. There's, there's, um, intangibles that you can't read on a computer. I mean, what a guy can do in a tough situation, his body language is certain things that you can't really read. But um, at the same time, I know sabermetrics and those sort of things with the, the track man that you can actually see the spin on a ball and be able to tell a young pitcher, like, you know, maybe he loves his curveball, but you can show him, hey, your slider is much more effective, much better spin rate than than your curveball. So that right there could give a kid conviction on, wow, okay, let me scrap this and actually focus on this, even though I've kind of been afraid to throw it. But now I know that it could be something that can really, you know, benefit from me. Uh, Was there a pitch that you wanted to try to master that you didn't throw? 
tried to master or, or tried to throw. I, I guess not master, but you know. I threw I threw a lot of pitches. Honestly, I came yeah. up just just four seam and then a spike yeah. curveball, which yep. was a good pitch for me. And I think you start tinkering with other things. I started mixing in a sinker and a cutter slider, and then I think doing those. I kind of took away from my forcing velocity, which I've heard before, and it makes sense because you're not you're not getting that just ripping through the ball and focusing on things, you know throwing through the catcher and building that arm strength, and you start manipulating the ball a little little more, and um, okay. it kind of got away from my strengths, but they also helped me out in in some aspects. I gotcha. So, um, you know what? As a player, maybe I don't know if you can really comment on it, but what would have been your mindset for? Um, the lockout and stuff. I mean, what would how would you have prepared this offseason with the lockout now that it's over, but during the lockout, I guess. I don't know. I was wondering that same thing because <laughs> I remember they they announced that the season was starting and I feel like spring training game started two days later. So I could yeah. those guys must have been in great shape and maybe know more than we knew behind closed doors that it was coming sooner than later because <laughs> that was that was amazing to me that I'm out here in Bradenton, your Sarasota area and I remember, oh, I'm going to the game in a couple of days. I'm like, they just announced the lockout's over. Like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Yeah. yeah. So, Chris, you got anything? Yeah. Is there a rule that you look at and you just don't like or they should change? Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple. <laughs> we, we've always talked about as a pitcher, there's only one, only one rule that benefits a pitcher, and it's – the ground rule double when the guy's going to hundred percent score, but he has to go back to third. That's the only one. Every other one kind of <laughs> goes against us. Like the, you can't assume a double play always kills us. Okay. Cause you can have a double play. It's going to end the inning and the ball gets slip out of your shortstop's hand. He throws it in the stands and the guy was dead in the water, but you can't assume it. So that, that, that run is now earned, which is incredible. But I'm assuming you might've been talking about the new ones and I think banning the shift I wasn't a big on, I wasn't a big fan on that. I don't understand it at all, except maybe the fact they're trying to create more runs scored or speed the game up. Because I guess it does take time to get everyone in position and then get back to position. But I don't, I don't need, I don't know why they need to, to change that. I mean, so you were for the shift or not for the shift? Yeah, if you want to. I mean, yeah, I don't see. I don't see why it's very hard to hit the ball the other way. Well, exactly. That's what we've talked about before. It's like. You know, if you're going to put the shift on this part of defense, learn to hit the other way or lay down a bunt down the third baseline. I mean, right. And I, uh, some announcer mentioned a few years ago that it was pretty 50 50 on when it works and doesn't. And he goes, if it's that close, the fact that you can throw a pitch and a guy can hit a weak ground ball and in the pitcher's mind, you're like one out and you turn around, he's not there. That can start, you know, frustrating you and, and kind of if it so if, if it was like 70 30 okay it's worth it but 50 50 and now yeah. you're frustrating the pitcher like that that's there's nothing worse than that yeah. if, and if a guy smokes a ball through the four hole anyways he beat like he beat me that's fine yeah. face it so we got but a question you, oh go, go ahead keep it going no i don't oh, say when you when you beat the hitter and a guy's not in position because you shift that's that's when it's frustrating yeah so we got a question from our fan here adrian um how do you think the short spring training will affect starting pitching at the beginning of the season and the pens uh, as you go deeper into the season? Um, I think if they do it smartly, it's it won't be too bad. I think they'll have a short leash on a lot of these pitchers. And just are they carrying extra in the bullpen? Have they announced that yet? Or are teams uh, might just I haven't heard themselves? nothing. I haven't heard they're expanding anything. I wonder if teams will carry eight though instead of seven and just ha- yeah. kind of have a, a long guy or a couple young long guys that can kind of eat up those innings that they need to, or to spread out those one innings at a time to, to not wear out that bullpen. But yeah. I think, I think guys can are, are smart enough to kind of take it and be okay. So, so speaking of pitchers hitting and stuff, what do you think of the new rule for an LDH? I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan, fan of that really either. It's just part. It's just part of the game in the National League. It was always. It's, it's tougher to manage. It's more of a, you know, you, you got to think more steps <laughs> ahead and, and, and know it's about to happen and kind of see the game and anticipate. So, I don't. I don't. It's got to be a score more runs type thing. I'm assuming, right? Yeah. No. I. Yeah. Definitely. Um. So, 
let's get outside the ballpark. Uh, where did you enjoy eating at at some of these uh, different cities that you played in? Hmm. I'm not really a foodie in that sense. I don't even remember oh, okay. a lot of – I mean, we would do – I always enjoyed bullpen dinners. You know, we landed in a new city. we drop our bags off and the whole bullpen go out to, you know, it's usually Capital Grill in that sense, which is always a good one because okay. we're staying in the big the big cities downtown, so everything's walking distance. Um, Colorado, we had a nice little bagel rec- breakfast shop called High Rise, which my wife and I enjoyed that. But um, off the top of my head, not too many others that, that stand out. Okay. Chris, you got anything else or Yeah, I'm mute, bud. Yeah. There you go. What was your preparation or you know, like preparing for a game? Oh, there you go. <laughs> um it's different. Different obviously as a reliever and starter. I mean reliever you don't really have you're kind of busy the whole time. So you you're getting there and getting something to eat, getting dressed, meetings, then you're going out and shagging. Coming in, shower, relax, get some food, and then you're going out to the bullpen. And like I said, you're just kind of locked in and watching the game. And then you start moving around around the fifth and get your mind ready and your body as loose as possible and, and kind of go from there. Starter, you're showing up to the field later, taking your time. Not really, you're not going out to BP, you're just kind of hanging out, which can get very boring, actually. Because I mean, <laughs> I guess in the big leagues, those, those clubhouses, you have everything at your disposal in the big leagues, but um. I was in Taiwan. It's a little a small clubhouse and not much to do. So I just go in the weight room, foam roll, and watch a movie or watch some episodes just to – you want to be thinking about the game the whole time. So it's kind of mindless stuff and then get ready hour and 30 minutes before the game usually. So we got another question here about the DH and the NL, or actually in general. Uh, what's your thoughts on the pitchers being able to stay in the game as if they're the DH, the Oatani rule is uh, – they're – Claiming that it is. I mean, I like that for him. I think I think he's earned that. So, I mean, is anyone else going to do that, though, is a question. Yeah, exactly. Probably. Mm-hmm. I, I don't even know. I mean, back in the day, you used to have Dwight Gooden that was able to hit. Sabathia could hit. You know, nowadays, it's just Mike, I think Mike, Mike Hampton could. He, yeah, he was, Mike he was, I think he had 10 homers that one year at Coors Field. But, oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Bumgarner could hit, I think, oh, a little yeah. bit. So who do you follow now all day? Is, uh, do you have a favorite team or you just enjoy baseball in general? Um, it was kind of opposite. I got back. I didn't really watch much at all just because the game has changed a lot and they had the, the shortened season with COVID. And so I literally hadn't watched any. And then the playoffs came around and I was <laughs> I started watching it. And it was just so much more enjoyable. to, And it's such a, you know, guys, like I used to know more guys in the big leagues. So it was always cool to see them, but. The game's so young now, and I've been out for so long that I don't know a ton of people. But I did, okay. I did enjoy watching the playoffs. So that was that was yeah, fun the playoffs were pretty yeah. awesome. So who did you? I mean, sitting in the bullpen, of course, you got to sit back on and enjoy some of the action. Who did you like watching? Like you see him on the schedule, like oh man, I can't wait to see so and so play. You know, um, I mean, I. I <laughs> If, if I'm excited to see him play, I'd usually have to face him. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I face a lot of the, the, big, the big guys. I think Big Poppy just got announced so to the Hall of Fame. So he's the fourth guy. I face four Hall of Famers now, which is cool. Oh, that's cool. Um, I mean, Mike Trout is obviously one of the best of all time. So I always enjoy watching him and just the way he goes about everything. And four or five tool guys. So he's he's probably one of the best I've ever seen. Who's your favorite uh, catcher to throw to? I know everybody's kind of got their favorite guy. You know, I enjoyed Ryan Hannigan with Cincinnati, who I came up with, and we kind of climbed ranks together. He was I, – I, I, he's one of those guys that hard-nosed, always dirty, like really took it serious on calling a game, blocking balls, like getting back there and like grinding for a pitcher because he, he kind of created that conviction for you. He'd get low, like tell you, like, come on, like come through me. And I was I always love that. And then, then there's guys that can get lazy back there, and they don't always show you the target. And that that's one one thing we always talk about is, you know, you have some catchers that hit 320 and a bunch of homers, and they're not really going to give that effort on the defensive side because they don't have to because their bat's probably more important. But I always enjoy throwing to the guys that are there for a reason, and that reason is the defense strictly and 
they're not too concerned with hitting me. They, they know, uh, you know, calling a game and especially having a young staff and uh, be on the block balls and kind of control the game is is just as important. Okay. Um, shoot, I just had a question for you too. And um, I was reading in your bio that you also played kick returner and receiver or D back at your college. Yeah, I don't know why. I've so, someone mentioned that before. I went there as a quarterback, and then I okay. converted a, re, a re, receiver my second and third year. So I, I, yeah, I played three years football, four years baseball. Any kind of second guessing on following football or no? No, because it out of high school. I was much better at football and I thought that would be my future. And so I got to college and it wasn't working out. I registered the first year, played a little bit, and then went back to the scout team. And at that time I wasn't really playing much in baseball either. I was kind of defensive replacement, but okay. I made the decision to stop playing football and focus on baseball. And that was the first time in my life that I'd now focused on only one sport. And so went to baseball, took over the center fielder job, then convinced our head coach to let me pitch a little bit and just kind of took it and went with it and started throwing harder and took over. I come in from center field to close games out sometimes. So that was, nice. that was interesting. And then the, the Reds draft me as a pitcher. So. Okay. Um, Chris, you got anything? Yeah. You kind of mentioned that you're, you played football as well. If you didn't have either, if you didn't play either baseball or football, what other sport would you have played or what basketball, other my, basketball, basketball. My, favorite, my favorite sport of all time. Yeah. I still oh. play throughout my whole career. I've played in the off seasons as my conditioning and kind of agility stuff. So that's always my favorite because it just pick up games or practice in general is more enjoyable than baseball and, and football in that sense. Okay. So but, you keeping up with the NBA a little bit or. Yeah. Me and my buddies play fan duel against each other every night. So <laughs> that, that helps us keep, <laughs> keep up with it. <laughs> But you bet your question about, and I kind of think about that too with regret with football. The only thing I think about is if I would have gone to a smaller school for football and maybe been a starting quarterback and to see how that would have gone would have been, it's hard to think about. But the fact that baseball worked out out of UCLA and I got to the major leagues is kind of hard to regret that. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, what was it like getting that call for your first? Do you remember getting that call for your first game? Yeah, I remember the call. It was the night after our playoff game in 08 in Durham. I think we lost to the Bulls. And then our GM and our manager and pitching coach, they were giving our exit meeting, saying bye to everybody. And they told me I was going up to the big leagues, which was shocking because, you know, I'd only been in the minor leagues less than two years. I wasn't even on the 40 man yet. So there's no chance that I'm getting called up because they just start my clock early. And they told me. And so I was pleasantly surprised going up to Arizona. I'm from California, so my grandma and cousins and parents and brothers and all my friends came out and Dusty Baker put me in the in the game with first and second, two outs in the eighth in a tie game, I think. And I walked the first guy on four pitches with you know, I, I was nervous, legs are kind of shaking. And then I uh, hit Adam Dunn with a curveball who I'd played with him the year before because I think he got traded. And then I struck out Mark Reynolds. So I had the, my first walk hit by pitch and strike out in the same third of an inning. <laughs> oh, okay. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, Chris, you got anything more? Or? Um, not at the moment, no. So, um, so since you not, I mean, you don't follow, you said you don't follow baseball closely right now. You're more of an NBA guy, follow? Well, I'm more of a football and that. And, Oh, okay. Watching on TV and following, I'd say, but I have four kids, four young kids at home, and <laughs> it's hard to follow anything really. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, you got any future minor league or major leaguers uh, in the household? Uh, maybe our, our my son is six. He's a lefty, so if he uh, he has a pretty good arm too. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I have, I have three girls and one boy. Okay, but, and we're getting joined by our other co-host here, Big Dog. Greg, how you doing, How's it Greg? Going? Uh, pretty good. How you guys doing today? Doing okay. Hey, okay. good. Uh, former MLB pitcher Josh here. Greg, got any questions for him? Oh man, how how was it uh, playing in the big leagues? <laughs> it was good, man. It was cool. Yeah, how long did you play? Um, I had up about parts of six years, so up and down for six years. A few few years that were constant in the big leagues and uh, four different teams, so it was. It was definitely a blessing. Yeah. 
What what teams did you play for? Cincinnati, Toronto, Colorado, and Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good range. What was it like living in uh, uh playing in Canada? Was it pretty good or yeah, that's what I was telling him because I came up with Cincinnati and we just got back from the road playing against the Blue Jays in Toronto. And I was like, that city is phenomenal. Like, I love the city of Toronto. And then like the next day I got traded to the Blue Jays. So it was kind of bittersweet in that sense. You think the Blue Jays are going to go uh, pretty far this year? I don't know. I haven't been paying too much attention to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. I mean, shoot, with that Dodgers lineup, who knows if anyone's going to do anything. And yeah. that bullpen. Do, do they have the that core of the bullpen back with Yeah, I think they I think they might have lost a couple guys, but I think they got pretty much I think a lot of people are coming back. So yeah, Dodgers are gonna be tough. The Braves are gonna I think be tough yeah. against Giants. So Mets Mets have Scherzer and DeGrom if they can score some runs. If DeGrom can stay healthy, I mean yeah. so so yeah, what I mean, you know, your your head must just be just like all over the place, you know, seeing these players sign for this like unlimited amount of cash. I mean, crazy. You know, well, I mean, I guess you don't have to go into too detail. What well, what was the biggest contract you got? Uh, mine were all. I was a right-handed reliever, so mine were all league minimum because okay. I didn't really. I didn't, to, I didn't even sign a contract till uh, my arbitration year was thirteen, and then I got non-tendered, so I never even made it to arbitration. So they were just the the one-year league minimum contracts. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Now they're making. Whatever, <laughs> it's just making know, billions. It's, yeah, it's you, crazy you, too. Is you don't see many that you don't see many of the contracts that have worked out for the teams either. Like, yeah. can you name one where the players performed really well throughout the contract? Exactly. I mean, I mean, you see a couple guys get the Barry Bonds or uh, Bobby Bonilla treatment. You know, yeah. or they're paying you know him not to play. You know, I think so. I think Griffey's still getting paid by the Reds. I heard. Yep, yep. I think uh, somebody. I think I saw a post where uh, he's the highest paid red this year. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Uh, um, do you think baseball needs a salary cap, or you know? I don't know. We have the best players union in base in sports, so it, it's hard to complain. I mean, we get guaranteed money, no salary right. cap. That's you see some of the things that go on with other, with other sports, and you're kind of thankful for ours being so strong. Yeah. Greg, you got in, anything else uh, you want to throw out there? For our yeah, guests? I wanted to. I wanted to ask out of all your years of uh, pitching in the bigs, who was who was probably your toughest out, the toughest guy to pitch to to try to get out. I think um, my nemesis. I think it was I think Austin Jackson was the best off of me. He was four for six with like a homer and a couple doubles. I think it's, it's weird. I always I always threw well against the superstars. I think I, I faced I faced Jeter twice, struck him out both times. Pedroia always handled well. And the Cabrera I struck him out a couple of times. Ichiro, but then there's the the little scrappy guys that always get to me. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, I was actually looking that up too because I remember coming across it. I think you were like uh, had four Ks against uh, Victor uh, Martinez, who was oh, a pretty yeah. decent hitter. Yeah, you know, I remember that. And yeah. he switched hitter, and I wasn't very good against lefties, so that's actually surprising. <laughs> <laughs> I had no change up, so I had nothing that would go away from them. It was brutal. Is there is well, there a oh go ahead, Greg? Oh sorry. What was your what was your go to pitch if you if you needed to get a quick strike or it kind of changed when I was coming up, I was a closer, so I I had a good arm. I was throwing all four seamers that you know would kind of jump on guys and I had twelve six curveball and then started mixing a sinker with Colorado because you know breaking balls don't move as much there. Um, but probably my, my four seam coming up for sure was the best pitch. Okay. Is there a hitter that you wanted to face that you never got a chance to? Yeah, Bonds. Oh, well, yeah, I guess I, I missed him, but I think he was done in 07. I got up there in 08, so that would have been cool. To oh. Face him. oh, wow, that would have been that would have been huge. I played with Griffey in spring, didn't yeah. face him in spring, but he was always he was always cool. We, we he got traded the year before me, and then we saw each other. When he saw that I got traded, and he was like, "They trade you already?" Because it was only like <laughs> two years. But uh, he was always super were you, friendly. Were you with Griffey and Cincy when he made that bet and paid all in pennies? And pennies. I heard about that. I don't know if that was oh. the same year. And I was in Billy camp with him in spring. Him okay. and Adam, him and Adam Dunn were a riot. 
Oh, I bet. Uh, was that uh, right before he got sent to the White Sox or back to the Mariners or Mariners? Yeah. Yeah. What do you uh, What do you miss about the game? Um, just competing. I mean, that's why I think that's why I always play basketball in the off season because this is this good pick up a game out here. I've been playing in for twelve years, and it's just you know competition and trying to beat the guy across from you and but keeping it you know friendly and just get the blood flowing and in that in that sense, I guess. But. Okay. How long have you been retired from the game? Um, shoot, what's that? Sixteen months now. I, September of twenty is when I got back home from Taiwan. That was my last time playing. Oh, okay. Did you know that was going to be your last? Yeah, I had a feeling that that year. I was, you know, I turned thirty nine that year. I had four kids at home across the world, and it was my fifteenth season. And I knew my elbow was kind of messed up, so I found out when it was torn anyway. So I would have had oh, to get okay. surgery, and now I'm you know, get rehabbing for a year and trying to get back to only Taiwan. So it's just, it wasn't worth it to try to keep going. Gotcha. So how, how hard was it on you and your family with you being halfway across the world? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was probably the toughest for sure. Just cause the 12 hour time change, even trying to FaceTime is difficult with them in school and them going to bed. They came out each year for, well, the first two years they came out for a couple months, but then with the pandemic and in, in 20, they couldn't even come out. So I was actually lucky to come back in March and have our baby in 20. And then I went back in quarantine and then, oh, okay. then I was gone for what, four or five months straight. And then I was done. Okay. So do you and your brother-in-law iron have Ian. any, uh, you know, um, not be put in my, like, bickering back and forth on careers and stuff or a little not, I mean, not, each other? Okay. not career not careers because he had a lot better career than i did but, uh, <laughs> we always, i mean we always joke around with the, you know, who's the better athlete and stuff but they oh, live like two yeah. they live two miles from us and they have five kids so we, we're oh, seeing we see them all the time every week god it sounds like it's gonna be like uh the movie cheaper by the dozen kind of we, we just watched of. we just watched a new one that's a good movie <laughs> <laughs> okay all right did you ever get to face him or? Yeah, I did three three times. Yeah. Two times were in Coors Field. I think he had a homer and a triple, and then Ooh. and then in DC, I I think breaking his bat for a ground out or something. All right, so he probably like, holds that over you a little yeah. bit, huh? I always, I always tell him though. I said, I mean, look at the facts. Both your hits are in Coors Field with the ball. You, I can't make the ball move, and the ball just takes <laughs> off. And then I'm at sea level, and I dominate you. So. <laughs> So is it really that big of a difference pitching oh. at Coors Field? I think I think people always think it's just how far the ball goes, but that's not it. It's the the movement out of your hand. The ball doesn't move. Oh, okay. So if, and it, and oh, we man. notice it too. Just playing catch, the ball's not moving. Then we go on the road to sea level because that division. You know, you have San Francisco, you have San Diego, Arizona, and our ball is moving all over the place. And sure enough, our hitters get you know shut out on the road all the time because they're not seeing that. And then we get then we go back to our place. Their pitchers can't make the ball move. We rake everyone. Our split was our hitters at three hundred at home and two twenty in the road. Oh wow! So that's that's the biggest difference that we know is that, that you can't manipulate the ball and make it move the way you want it to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, well. So you got any? Uh, you know, close it up here. Got any cool road stories to, you know, you don't have to throw people's names out there, but you got any like cool road stories, pranks or something that you saw happen or? Um, <laughs> not off the top of my head, drawing okay. a blank. Gotcha. Is uh, minor league baseball, is it, is it pretty fun or is it pretty, a uh, pretty hard grind for a while or? Yeah, it's definitely a grind for a while, and AAA is pretty fun just because you get up there, and a lot of times they're older guys that have been in the big leagues, and it's kind of a holding tank for the big leagues. So the coaches are super lackadaisical. They know why. They know the guys, you know, there know the game and playing a while. You know, the fundamentals just kind of let loose a little bit and enjoy it and just kind of wait for a call up. And you're still trying to win and be competitive, but it's not as – they're not as strict and, and you know, working on drills and taking – BP every day or infield outfit every day. So it's, it's a lot more lackadaisical in that sense. Yeah. 
that so you uh, it, play. Um, go ahead, Greg. No, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, any minor league ball um, on the West Coast and the Pacific Leagues or anything with like uh, the Eugene M's or the Kaiser Volcanoes or anything? Um, I played. No, I played in. Uh, I played in the PCO, which is the Triple A Pacific Coast League. But um, yeah, there's that, that's all on the West uh, West Coast. Is that where you are right now? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Oregon, so we have like the Eugene M's and the Salem Kaiser Volcanoes and. <laughs> Who's the um that's double A. Um I didn't know if maybe you played in that league or I played in Tacoma, that's Seattle's triple A team. Um I played at UCLA, so I played I didn't we didn't we didn't play I think Oregon had a baseball team back then though. Played at Oregon State, they had some really good teams back when I was in college. Oh five, I think they won oh six, oh seven back to back. Yeah. So what is uh some advice your dad gave you? Um, you know, through his journey to the MLBs that you took to heart. Um, well, it, it's it was kind of tough just because he's an outfielder, and I mean, I was an outfielder for a long time yeah. in college and stuff, and we just weren't the same kind of hitters. He had we were built the same, but he had a lot of pop. He hit homers whenever he wanted, and I was kind of more of an inside out hitter, and this wasn't as good as him hitting. But then I, you know, became a pitcher and. Him and my uncle would just kind of, kind of give me the hitting side of it, you know. Because it's nice to know the hitter's thinking as well. So, yeah. in that sense, he was he was helpful, and so was my uncle, and and just kind of prepping me for that. My older brother played minor leagues, so just kind of giving me the rundown on what it's going to be like. And okay. so it's always we're always we're all t- always talking baseball every holiday, and every time we got together, <laughs> so that's. That's just the well, norm for the last 30 years, you know. I was going to say, it must have made the ladies in the family all happy when you guys all got together, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of eye rolling. Yeah. So what's some advice you could give to – would you give to some young athletes now that are coming up and want to be where you're at or where at? You know, I, I like to tell kids, like, ba- don't – Baseball is one sport you can't sell yourself short. Like basketball and football, a lot of those guys, you know, they bloom early and they're kind of freaks of nature athletically. And if you don't look like them, it's kind of – you can't see yourself making it. But baseball is such a skill game. Like if you can master those skills, and that's why that's why practices and, and games and is so methodical and tedious. It's that way because it's – their skills you have to develop that other sports you don't have to. Okay. And with me, I didn't have a single – offer from a college team for baseball so as i tell kids like i was i was better at football and basketball i knew i was i like i love playing baseball so i knew i was going to play in college also and so i walked on the baseball team i knew i was going to do that was playing center field and then didn't get drafted for the you know first couple years that i was eligible in college and then my fifth year senior year i get drafted but that was the first time in my life that I'd actually focused on not just one sport, but one position. So now when everything kind of started clicking and I could focus on just one thing, and that's when I kind of really took off with it. But you don't, you won't hear many that guys that could get to the Billies without having a single offer from college. So I think just be patient with the game and, and just let, let those skills develop. It might take longer than others, but once you, you catch up to them and, and keep getting better and working hard, it can, it can take you a long way. What was that? What was that phone call like uh, draft night, or when you found out you got drafted? <laughs> we had we had a good team that year. We had a lot of talent, so we had like I think we had twelve guys drafted that day. Wow! But um, we, we we had a feeling that a couple of other friends were going to go a little earlier. We had one guy go the first round, and then our good friend went the fifth round. And so we're all in the, our apartment together, drinking beer because we were of age, obviously at that time. <laughs> And uh, we ran out, and so they all left to get beer. And <laughs> I'm at home, and then my, my name gets drawn while they're gone. So we, we didn't get to celebrate. Oh. They, they came back, and I'm like, I went in the 10th. They're like, oh. Oh, so it no. It, yeah. But that was a, it was a fun day. Uh, what was that call like calling home to your parents, letting them know you got drafted, or were they watching it too? Uh, I don't know if they were watching. Well, it wasn't televised back then. I think it was just on oh. the ticker. We, we'd yeah. follow it. But um, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, it was special. They were, they were excited, and we didn't know how early I was going to go. I was a super senior, so I didn't have much leverage, so it worked out. Well, do you kind of recall what your options would have been if you didn't get drafted? Were you going to go 
walk no, out I mean, somewhere or no at that time you know you're gonna get drafted just because you have all the teams talking to you beforehand saying oh, okay we'll go we're gonna take you this round or this or this but before that we had we had regionals we, we mentioned regionals at pepperdine and i'd already finished all my um, requirements so i was i was considered a free agent because i had no more school left and so i remember someone telling me like you could actually be a free agent in the draft and kind of have leverage if you don't play in the regionals but i was like there's no way i'm not playing in regionals like that's yeah. why you play so yeah. that was is a unique situation that i had no more school left and could have actually been a free agent in the draft yeah no that yeah i mean you play to get into those positions i mean yeah. postseason there's nothing better than that yeah greg chris you guys got anything yeah how long uh in the minor leagues do you think it normally take someone um you know if they have the potential to break a major league team uh does it usually take to, to work your way into a major league spot i mean it depends it's that's too hard it depends on how i think how old you are too like i was telling them when i signed i was a fifth year senior so i was 23 years old almost 24 so i flew through just because when you're when you're older they're going to try to push you and then if you keep excelling as you're older they don't need to take their time with you. But if you have a guy, a stud signing a 17 or 18, I think Votto, I think Votto spent like five years in the minor leagues and look at, look at him. Like he was young, even though he was doing well, they kind of have time to develop him a little more and a little longer and be patient. So it depends, but that's a cool thing is once you get to your sixth year in the minor leagues, you're a free agent, you can actually start making money. You can live on oh, well, okay. back, back then you could, I don't nowadays. I don't, I don't know how it works <laughs> in the minor leagues. It's weird. Yeah. So we got a question here from Adrian again. Uh, wants to know what the difference between uh, hitters in the Japanese league and American ball were like. Um. Well, I was in Taiwan, but we watched a lot of Japanese games. Japan's a definitely a pitcher's league. It's kind of a dead dead ball and not much offense, but really good arms from the locals. And then I was in Taiwan and and like Korea, it's more of a, a hitter's league because the local, locals don't throw as hard. Okay. But um, the difference is, oh, man, the defense is noticeably different. Like the guys behind you, you know, in the big leagues or even AAA, you, they're, they're, the ball gets hit. You know it's going to be an out. And a lot of times there it's it can get frustrating because – the de- defensive skill level is not nearly what it is over here in the in the big leagues. Okay. Chris, yeah, mute, bud. Huh. Sorry about that. Um, oh, that's good. Is there any like you're talking about the Hall of Fame class earlier? Is there anyone that didn't get selected who you thought should have gotten in? Oh. <laughs> Josh, you're on uh, mute, I think. Oh. Josh, you're on mute. There you go. I would say the, the obvious one is the one I thought she got in. That's Bonds. I mean, yeah. to me, he's a, no, he's a no doubt Hall of Famer. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people, I mean, you know, Everybody's got their opinion, but I'm I'm with you. I think Bond should be in. I think Rhodes should be in. Um, well, I, what was the number? Someone said like my whole thing is if you don't take him, then everyone anyone from that era should not be allowed in. Nope. It's just because everyone knows it was happening, just because they didn't test positive or whatever. Like, there's obvious ones that shouldn't be in then. And I I heard someone say what like 18 guys in the Hall of Fame have tested positive for uh, yes something like that. Yeah. Yeah. PFDs, whatever. PEDs. So. All right. Um, guys, we got anything else for Josh? Or Greg, you got yeah, anything? I, I had uh, one more question because I think oh. when I came in, you guys might have been talking about – I can't remember if you guys were talking about uh, player salaries or um, how oh, some yeah, play, play great all the way through their contracts. Um, do you think that a team um, that has a – really high quality player um, should just lock in early and, and throw money early at a player like the Padres did with uh, Tatis, or do you think that they should wait 
because sometimes a player signs a deal, you know, when they're like 28, and then by the time they're 38, you know, right. so they don't show up as well. I think with those special players like him, though, the team knows as, as it gets closer to free agency, they might lose him completely. So they want to take their shot and, and get him early and hopefully get him at a discount. A lot of those guys get those pre arb deals. I don't, he what he got like a massive amount, but yeah. before him, they're they're getting like almost like guys on discount because the guy's like, I don't want to wait till free agency, so I'll take a little less. So if a team can do it that way, it's pretty smart. I've just seen a lot of teams try to sign, sign a guy when he's thirty to a long long term deal, and sometimes when the guy gets about 36, 37, you know, their their statistics right. are half as what they were when they were like twenty nine, thirty. So I know. I wonder if I wonder if those. I wonder if those yeah. cases that they do it, maybe knowing that, but also wanting him to keep him around for clubhouse morale or younger guys coming up and just kind of that whole package instead of just the performance on the field. Yeah. Has there been any advice that a player has given you uh, throughout your career to kind of help you uh, get through your career at all um, or a coach? I remember uh, – Early on in my career, I remember Votto told me we were watching film one day on hitters and stuff, and he was t- we were talking about the pitchers' meetings. And I remember him telling me, like, you know, on scouting reports, you're going to hear the the hitters' weaknesses and this and that. He goes, but don't ever go away from your strength and just just try to go to their weaknesses. So if your strength is this and that's his strength too, use it. Don't try to do something you're not good at just because he's not good at it. So that was a, that's always a, a good thing to keep in mind. Oh, okay. Well, that's a good one. Anything else, guys, before we call it a show? All right. So, with that being said, uh, Josh, I want to thank you for coming on. It was an honor to talk to you. And, you know, yeah. maybe we can do this midseason or, you know, we'll reach out again. But uh, just want to thank everybody. Uh, Chris, why don't you uh, talk what we got going on uh, C2C for the next yeah, couple of days? Coming up. Coming up in about an hour, we have uh, Tuesday Night Mania kind of talking some, you know, wrestling wrestling history and then uh, just stay with the network for a great bunch of great shows coming up. All right. Awesome, Josh, guys. Got- yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. It was, it was a pleasure and uh, always, always fun to talk ball. Oh, yeah. Th- yeah, definitely. Thank you for being on. Uh, with that being said, uh, check us out next week as we uh, get ready for opening day. So, Thank you for our viewers. Josh, thank you again. Greg, yep. Chris, uh, check us all next week on Tuesday for On Deck. Thank you. All right. See you.